Hey, what's up guys? It's Dr. D Flo, and I have an interesting case study for you. My friend pulled this part off of a linear motion platform that he's trying to modify and resell. It basically supports a long lead screw, but in its current form, the lead screw can still wobble uh, inside of this hole. To fix this problem, my friend wants me to machine a pocket to accept a bearing that will eliminate that extra movement. It might make more sense to just machine this part from scratch, but my friend has about 50 of these, and if I were able to create a workflow to quickly add the pocket for the bearing, then I could save him some money and eliminate waste. When it comes to milling, I prefer nice square parts because they're easy to hold on to, uh, and when I use a stop, I don't have to probe subsequent parts. However, as the guy with the mill, I find most of my requests are for modifying these weird types of geometries. When I ask for a CAD file, my friends look at me like I have a horn growing out of my head. I would assume that this would be a common occurrence for job shops that take walk-in customers. Anyways, without digital data on this part, it would be difficult for me to reconstruct the geometry to make soft jaws. If you're not familiar with soft jaws, they're basically just blocks of aluminum that are machined to match the outside perimeter of your part. They are great for odd shapes, but they have to closely match your part's contour or they're not going to work very well. Fortunately, this project came up at just the right time because I was offered the opportunity to tour 3D Chimera, the reseller of the DIY SLS printer that I built a couple videos ago. This company is more than just a reseller of additive manufacturing machines, but they also offer 3D printing and 3D scanning services. I'm hoping they can help me out with that work holding problem for this part when I'm there. But they're located in Miami, so I need to go pack. I made it to sunny Miami with my part and bearing. I'm standing outside of 3D Chimera. In just a minute, we're gonna go in and talk with the CEO, Alex Hussein, who's gonna help me with the manufacturing workflow of my buddy's part. Let's go ahead and talk to him now. Hey, Alex. Hey there, welcome to Miami. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So we talked about it on the phone, I got my buddy's part. And okay. I need a way to hold it in my mill so that I can modify about 50 of them to add this bearing. All right, let me check that out. What do you got for me? Okay, so you don't have a 3D model for this? No 3D model. Okay, <laughs> all right, no problem. We run into that all the time. Um, so for something like this, the first step is going to be 3D scanning it. Okay. Um, so with the 3D scan data, we'll have a digitized model. Okay. Um, then from there, we can design up a soft jaw. Perfect. Geometries like that are perfect for printing on an FFF printer. Okay. Um, we do a lot of stuff like that. You can see different types of uh, you know functional parts here. Um, we usually like to use like a carbon fiber reinforced nylon for that. Would that yeah, work? Stiffer the better for fixed ring. We don't want any kind of flex as we're machining multiple parts. Yeah. Right? That's about as stiff as it gets oh. in, in this space. So perfect. Uh, you'll get very strong parts. They'll even be a little bit more lightweight than uh, normal uh, nylon part, but they're going to be very, very strong, very stiff. So during the 3D printing process and 3D scanning, I hope that we can dive into kind of how 3D Chimera came to be, because really it's probably many of my viewers' dreams. It's my dream to go from printing in my house to creating a business uh, with employees that's focused around added manufacturing. So I would love to hear more about the story during this whole process. Sure, we can definitely get into details. I mean, the 10,000 foot view is we started just like everybody else. We started with, uh, with a, a single 3D printer and we were doing service for folks. Um, you know, we were always focused on functional parts. I'm an engineer and so, uh, you know, making parts for engineers has always been what we do. From there, our business has really grown. I mean, today we say we do everything with the three threes. So 3D printing, 3D scanning, and 3D CAD. Um, anything that touches that, whether it's on the service side or even offering equipment to customers and helping to train them. But for sure, we can get into details later. So it's not weird me walking in with this part? No, no, this is, this is what we do all the time. Awesome. Uh, yeah, no problem. So let's go ahead and 3D scan it first. All right, let's get started. So I've done a lot of 3D printing and even more CAD design, but one kind of hole in my knowledge is 3D scanning. Now I've had some experience with the iPhone, the rotating platter, but this system looks to be a little bit more complex. What differentiates the iPhone scanner 
from a professional system like this. Okay, yeah. So this is a 3D scanner from Polyga. Uh, they're based out of Canada, and they make these pretty high accuracy 3D scanners. So um, inside of a 3D scanner, even on the iPhone, they, they all sort of work the same. We're going to be projecting a pattern on the object, and then we're going to be viewing that pattern and interpreting that as three-dimensional geometry. Now, this uses a technology called structured light. So it's going to put a black and white pattern that kind of looks like a QR code on the object. That allows you to get really into the fine details and get super high resolution data. So we should be able to get within about 50 microns of this surface, which should be more than close enough for making our soft jaws. That's incredible. And we just need the perimeter, but you could pick up even more features than that, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we do a lot of types of 3D scans here. So we work with aerospace companies to do things very similar to this. But I also work with artists, archaeologists. Sometimes we're scanning artifacts or, you know, beautiful, like one-of-a-kind sculptures. The same technology can do all of these things. And interestingly, in 3D scanning, the more complex an object is, typically the better it is for scanning, because the scanner is looking for those unique geometries to map the data together. Very interesting. That's awesome. And I was kind of talking about it in the beginning of this video, but it's really not uncommon to have a part that has no CAD design data to it. Right. Right. And so how often are you receiving like consumer off the shelf parts from that are imported that you need to generate the 3D model for? Yeah, well, uh, you know, these days supply chain is a huge problem. So we see a lot of customers coming to us, not only with, you know, competitive products that maybe they want to compare themselves to, but often with their own products that they don't necessarily own the data to. Mm. They've worked with a partner overseas who's created it and maybe no longer can or have huge supply chain issues. So. That's a very common application. Um, we can help to recreate that 3D data, reverse engineer their own part so they can produce it in another way, sometimes with additives, sometimes with traditional manufacturing. So are you going to show me how to collect some CAD data from our mysterious uh, curves on our part? <laughs> well, I know a little bit about these things, and I'm actually going to bring in an expert. Uh, my colleague Julian works with these things every day, and he'll be happy to walk you through the process. So you're the 3D scanning expert, Julian? That's right. Is this part ready to be scanned? Um, looking at it, it's uh, fairly reflective as it's metal part. Uh, there's a couple ways that we can do this, but our go-to method is actually to spray it with a little bit of a chalk substance to bring down that reflectivity. As our scanner is light-based, uh, that will help increase our accuracy. So the popsicle sticks are actually there to, uh, so you don't have fingerprints and stuff on your part. And will, will that coating come off? Yeah, the coating uh, is just wash it off with a little bit of uh, warm water and a dish rag. All right, we have uh, all the exposure settings set up correct. Uh, now all we have to do is press scan. It's already generated the, the model. Mm -hmm. The more times it spins, is it the more ac does it get, become more accurate? Um, you want to be a little careful with that as uh, some data may be overlapping, especially if uh, maybe someone bumps the table or, or something like that. So uh, there is such a thing as taking too much data. Okay. So really you just want to do maybe a once around to capture exactly what you need. And then from there you can um, generate your mesh file. All right, so this is uh, what we've collected from just this uh, scan here. So this is a uh, point cloud, um, which represents a little bit more data than you would see in a mesh. Um, but the software will be able to pick and choose exactly uh, what's best fitting for uh, your setting. So you can have more smoothing if it's a, you know it's a smooth part. Uh, you can have higher, lower resolution. Uh, basically, you're collecting all the data, and then the software is going to sort through a lot of it. So while it seemed pretty easy to collect the 3D model data, translating it from this point cloud or STL file into a usable model in Fusion or SolidWorks seems like it's the hard step. That's right. There's one additional step here in uh, the STL cleanup, uh, as well as the reverse engineering to collect the data that we really need um, so that we can use that for our reverse engineering in SolidWorks or 360. And that's really where 3D Camera comes in. So even if you bought the fancy uh, 3D scanner, there is still some engineering needed behind the scenes. That's correct. But can you dumb it down and give us a quick behind the scenes look at you know, that, that big step? I think I can do that, yeah. So while we could use the scan data to create a uh, fully watertight mesh, which could be 3D printed, our end goal is to have a fully editable CAD file. 
the, because the part is fairly simple and symmetric in X, Y, and Z, we can take a clever route here and really all we need is a 2D sketch. Don't let the chamfers fool you. So I'm gonna open up the 3D scan data here in our software called the Quick Surface. It's a nice reverse engineering tool that allows me to quickly pull off um, any relevant features as well as 2D slices. So really all we need is a 2D sketch here that shows us the exterior profile. That's gonna be our surface that is going to be clamped in our soft jaws. Here we've uh, imported the sketch here into SolidWorks where we can make the cut into our soft jaws. All right, now we've got a STL that we can print. I'm gonna hand this off to Alex now. So we've got quite the interesting setup here for just FFF. Could you give me a little bit of an overview of what we got going on here and how we're gonna print these soft jaws? Sure, totally. So you know, this is not that different than your normal home FFF 3D printer. This particular machine we sourced from a, a company in Germany. Okay. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's built with super rigid construction, um, which really helps us to get really reliable, really repeatable prints. Um, but one of the beautiful things about it is it is a totally open material system. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be printing some, some carbon fiber nylon here. One of the challenges with carbon fiber nylon is it really likes to absorb moisture, especially here in Miami. Okay. Um, so we've actually developed these dry boxes up here so these might look familiar to your viewers. I mean, it's a basically like a Pelican type of case. We've got a special spool holder in here. The most important part is this color changing desiccant. Mm -hmm. So when this turns pink, we know that we've got too much moisture in here and we've definitely got to stop the print. What this helps us to do is uh, make sure that our prints are gonna come out consistent and repeatable. It gives us a great surface finish and prevents any surprises along the way. Sure, so as a business, first off, you need your parts coming out consistently the same. You've got some kind of base level quality that you need to meet, and every print failure is gonna be time and money, right? Absolutely, time and money, and a lot of times customers are coming to us, not because they don't have a printer, but because they need it done quickly, or okay. they need it done perfectly the first time. So, you know, we have a print failure overnight, that's a huge problem. So, okay. we try to do everything we can to eliminate those variables, and these machines really help with that. So. You know, we don't have to re-level the printer every time. We re-level maybe once a month, and the machine's gonna remain completely stable at that point. Yeah, I see that you have, this looks like almost like a 12 millimeter linear rod, so yeah, this is gonna be a very rigid machine. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's truly in a German engineered machine, so, um, you know, we could drop this thing off the back of a truck, and it'd probably just start printing perfect right after that. Yeah, there's no plastic in the extruder, but it still looks like you're using the you know, the rigorously tested, you know, E3D extruder. So that's awesome. That's right, yeah. It's basically a, an E3D V6 style hot end. Okay. Um, it's got a couple mods to it in order to, to make it work well with the carbon fiber reinforced nylon and to kind of plug and play with the system. But yeah, yeah, you know, off the shelf parts there. So easy to maintain then. It may be a little bit more expensive for the heavy duty construction, but when you have it, you can maintain it. That's what it's all about. That's what it, there's definitely an investment up front when you're looking at equipment like this. But what you're buying is that repeatability and reliability, and you're taking that tinkering out of the equation. Awesome. So for preparing the build platform, I take it you don't use hairspray? We do not use hairspray. So we've got this great stuff. It's called Demafix. So we actually source this from Spain. And um, you know, there's a lot of different things you can apply to the build plate. This one has worked incredibly well for us. We use it for, you know, works for PLA and PETG. We're going to use it here for carbon fiber reinforced nylon. Um, we've also used it for polycarbonate, for ABS. Um, so we really love it. And so we use it exclusively here in our shop. It's like, you look on our printers, it'll be on the side of every single machine. Yeah, um, and so our soft jaws that we're printing, they're very square. And you normally worry about those parts that they're gonna lift up on the corners, so. Right, exactly. So okay. this will prevent any type of corners from lifting. So you know, the, plat is, the, the plate is very flat, um, mm -hmm. so we have that, but this will help. And it's super easy to put on. So basically, um, it's, it, it's kind of like a glue stick, but way, way thinner. Mm -hmm. And that's it, that's all we do. So really my only requirement for the material for these jaws is that it's stiff. 
so that we get repeatable clamping. Now, you're printing this with carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is obviously very stiff and has a lot of name brand recognition, um, but are there other materials that we could use and do you default to carbon fiber for applications like this? Yeah, most of the time our customers ask for carbon fiber, so we are set up to do that every day, all day long. Uh, with that said, there's a lot of other composite materials. The benefit of the composite materials are that these fillers help to prevent your parts from warping and give them this extra stiffness. Um, so carbon fiber is one, uh, but one that we really like, and it's kind of like maybe underrated out there, is glass fiber reinforced material. So glass fiber reinforced nylon is going to have very similar strength, but the material itself isn't going to be as brittle. So just loading your machine, setting it up, all of that's a little bit easier to work with than the carbon fiber, which tends to kind of crack and be a little more brittle. Interesting. So this is laying down the perimeter layers. It's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, when we were scanning that model, I saw a couple other printers in the back of the shop. I would love to take a look at those and possibly learn more about your story and how you went from printing at home to actually having a small business. Sure, I'd love to show you that stuff. Sweet. Let's go. All right, let me show you what we've got going on back here. I think this big printer caught your eye before, is that right? Oh yeah, I saw it in the back when we were 3D scanning. All right, well let's take a look see inside here. So this is our X1000 3D printer, so that's 1,000 millimeters across, basically one meter across. So you can see a couple large parts uh, that fit in this build volume, but it goes basically a meter by 0.8 meters deep. So you got a really big uh, build platform to, to print large parts. So usually with a size of this magnitude, you'd have something like a pellet extruder um, that would be really low resolution, but you know high throughput. I see that you have again, just those nice E3D extruders. Can you tell me, like, kind of the benefit of using a filament-fed extruder versus a pellet extruder for a format like this? Yeah, it, there's a trade-off, of course. So, um, you know, we're using a filament-based extruder. We usually put a large nozzle on there, so like a 0.8 nozzle, uh, and we're printing usually with something like a 0.4 layer. Uh, but you know, the benefit of a large nozzle, obviously, you get a lot more material out more quickly. The trade-off is that if you're printing with big layers, you lose that resolution. Now the cool thing is, because we have those E3D style hot ends on there, we can pop in other size nozzles. So if we need to do a very fine resolution part that's very large, that's not a problem. We can do that on this system. Um, so it's not going to be quite as fast as a pellet fed extruder, but you're going to get all the detail there. Right, because you can retract. It's filament. With pellet extruders, you can't retract, so distinct parts have all that stringy. Uh, between them. Right, yeah, that's that's one of the negatives about pellet. I mean, it's got its own benefits too. You know, so like everything in 3D printing, there's a special niche for each application. This is for very large parts that need high resolution. Okay, and so just looking at a bed this size, and it's, it's making me a little nervous. How is the bed adhesion on a, on a bed that size? And how hard is it, how hard is it to calibrate it? Yeah, so calibrating it is a little tricky. So there's actually like a grid of like 32 adjustment points underneath the machine. 32? Yep, so we pop this, this whole front plate off, we crawl underneath, and we adjust each one to get it exactly level across the plate. But what's nice is once it's level, you don't end up re-leveling this guy. So it's usually good until you physically move the machine to another location. Okay. Um, and then getting parts stuck on the build plate, we still use that Dima fix. That's gonna uh, get everything stuck on there. Yep, that's gonna work good for giant parts as well. That's what we use all the time. Awesome, and yeah. I guess so if this is the big boy, what's going on with this printer over here? Yeah, so this is our X500. So if this is 1000, this is 500. Okay. Um, so it's half the size, so it's about a half a meter in width. Um, this machine's a completely different animal. So the large format printer over here, it has heated bed, heater extruders, but not a heated chamber. So it's good for PLAs and PETGs, materials that don't have a high shrink rate. The X500 is specifically built for high temperature materials. So it's going to go one to one against any printer out there for polycarbonate, ABS, things of that nature. But it's hot and can get super hot, up to over 450 C. And for you know, certain parts, we can print in Ultem and PEC and Peak and all sorts of really exotic engineering grade materials as well. So when you get to those exotic materials, there's got to be some special things underneath this hood, right? Yeah, you want to take a look see in here? All right, so, so you inside. see the way that that opens? <laughs> yeah, it's that's pretty like cool. The, the Mercedes, the gold wing doors, that's awesome. Yeah, thank the Germans for that. <laughs> <laughs> so in here, uh, what you're going to see, the, probably the first thing you'll notice is um, we have the ability to run the E3D style hot end, but we also have a much more beefy hot end over here. That's our high temp hot end. It's got dual heater cartridges in it. It's running like a, a PT100 thermocouple in there so we can get a much higher temperature range. 
But the thing that's most noticeable is we have these water-cooled hot ends. Wow. So the system actually has water cooling throughout it, not just on the hot ends, but on all the stepper motors and everything in here. This chamber is getting real hot, uh, you know, up to almost like 90 C. Mm -hmm. And so at that temperature, stepper motors are going to start to lose steps and act funky. So the water cooling allows all that to work. It may be hard to see, but there's just a lot of engineering that goes behind allowing for a chamber to be that hot. Like you can see, as you said, all the steppers are protected, right? Yeah. Common plastics that are found in other 3D printers would start to soften at that temperature and they can't be used, right? Yeah, so inside this machine, I mean, if we were to take it apart, which I've done before, everything in here is gonna be machined aluminum or steel components. Nothing inside of this machine is gonna be plastics. There's no 3D printed parts. This is a truly industrial machine. It's built with the same type of stepper drivers and controllers and CNC machines, and it's a very rugged unit. So that, that is really cool. Um, and the build volume is obviously humongous as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a really big unit. I mean, it, this is actually the chamber heater here, which is kind of cool to see. So it's like, you know, right there for all eyes to see how it works. So it's basically a, you know, a heater and it's blowing, you know, forced air through the system. But it can be tough to build a system like this on your own just because you have to have everything sealed up. It has to be fully insulated. And it's getting super hot. I mean, this is mm -hmm. like cook, cook food inside of like an oven hot. Like so, dangerous like hot. Like super right. dangerous <laughs> hot. So, yeah. You know, I think usually high temperature machines make sense in an industrial environment. They can be a little sketchy, um, you know, in a, in a more hobbyist approach. So it can be done, especially with good skills. But, um, you know, we really like these industrial machines when our customers are trying to uh, print parts maybe in the aerospace or automotive industry that are truly functional. They're going to be, you know, placed in, in actual in-use application. Um, you know, these really give you a step ahead. So we haven't really addressed this point yet, but 3D Chimera is definitely focused on the business world, right? I think you use the term business to business. It's your guys' number one customers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we'll, we certainly will work with anybody who's looking to do things in the 3D printing space. Um, but yeah, we're really focused truly business to business. So we call that B2B. And um, we've always been that way from the very beginning. Um, you know, I'm an engineer and I purchase 3D printers and 3D printed parts and 3D scanning services through the years. And we saw there was a pretty big gap in the market. So that's the gap that 3D Chimera fills. And so we like to work with other engineers and help them to be more efficient with their you know, product development, advanced manufacturing approaches. But obviously, I found them, so they're working with the prosumer as well. Yeah, totally. But you have machines here that are worthy of aerospace grade work. Exactly. OK, so I've been wanting to ask, what is up with this punching bag? What, you don't have a punching bag in your shop? Uh, I probably would be a little bit bigger <laughs> if I did. <laughs> is that the secret? <laughs> that's, the, that's part of it. But uh, it's a little bit for stress relief, but it's also a great demonstration of the strength of 3D printed parts. So um, this is actually an SLS 3D printed part up here. This is printed out of PA12 nylon. How heavy is this bag? So this is a pretty heavy bag. Uh, it's a literal heavy bag. <laughs> Somewhere between you know 75 and 100 pounds or so. Okay. That's intention. But we've actually... Uh, done some tests with this part, and we've been able to intention to hold over 690 pounds, which uh, is actually, uh, I think, 13 cinder blocks stacked mm -hmm. up. Uh, so it's, it's very, very strong in tension, and it's also very good in compression. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty cool material. You know, I mean, what, what is the application for that part we were looking to... You know, it's kind of, it's for stabilizing a lead screw. So it's not under super high mechanical stresses. Mm -hmm. um, but my buddy needs kind of a lot of them, about 50. Well, I mean, that might be the perfect fit for this technology. Because in SLS, we can, we can build really strong, robust parts. It's like perfect for, you know, engineering grade components. And uh, it's also a batch process. So, you know, for us, printing 50, I mean, we could do that overnight. You could have 50 parts the next day. So you're telling me that you can print my soft jaws as well as the final part? Well, yeah, I'm thinking we could try it, certainly. I think for us it would be not too much of an issue to, to do a batch print. We could print maybe all 50 of them up. I'm pretty confident it's going to work perfect for your application. And maybe we can save the time on uh, that, that CNC work for you. So we just have the, the, the perimeter of the part uh, with uh, Julian. Do you think he can go ahead and do the rest of the conversion from the 3D model to the final solid? Yeah, for sure. He's going to have to just take that data. That's a process we call reverse engineering. Okay. So yeah, we do that all the time. So we'll take the 3D data, we'll rebuild it. In this case, again, it's, it's a symmetrical part, so it's quite easy to, to build. We really only have to focus on a, like a, an eighth of it and we'll kind of mirror it around. 
And there's no problem with adding that extra feature because the whole reason is to add that extra bearing so that there's more support on the lead screw. There's yeah, no problem so, with that. So there's a little bit of work there. So um, that's probably one of the most challenging parts about 3D scanning is that the scanner is going to output a data that's not really perfect for CAD. Mm -hmm. um, usually it's going to output like an STL file, but we're going to need like some type of parametric CAD data. So we'll actually rebuild that object in CAD. Uh, we'll either use our quick surface software or SolidWorks to completely rebuild that part. And then, yeah, we can add features and, and tweak or change whatever we need to. Perfect. Yeah, Julian touched on that, but it was purely from the soft job point, which is a little bit more simple. Yeah. Uh, he's got a lot of experience also pressing parts into um, 3D printed components, making sure that the tolerances are going to stack up just right. So we may have to think a little bit, like some design for additive, just making sure that those tolerances are right to press that bearing in, have it stay in place. But he's the man for that sort of thing. Uh, what are your thoughts about the soft jaw? Should we take those off and check that fit up before we start with the SLS? Yeah, absolutely. Let's check that out. I think that's just about done. Uh, we'll see how that goes, and then we'll get the SLS parts started in parallel. Awesome. All right. Well, here's, uh, these are our parts. These are the, the carbon fiber reinforced nylon um, for the soft jaws. I think they turned out good. You want to do a test fit? Yeah, I mean, that surface finish is PLA-esque. Yeah, it's, a, it's at least that good. I mean, I really like the surface finish on the carbon fiber nylon. Gives it sort of a matte look to it. These parts are going to be super strong, super stiff. Um, we could be standing on these things. I'm sure it'll be plenty strong enough to, uh, to hold the parts for your uh, CNC operation. Let's check the, how the two pieces fit in. Yeah, that's going to be the key, right? So um, I know we wanted it to be a tight fit. Let's make sure that, that that's lining up appropriately. That's beautiful. All right, I guess the 3D scanner worked okay. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. You got it. Okay, I am like almost 100% certain that this is gonna work no problem, but I won't know until I get back to my shop. At least we have a backup plan, which is? Yeah, I mean, we're gonna have that batch print off the SLS 3D printer. So you're gonna go back with 50 parts. So hopefully one of those is gonna work for you. Fantastic, <laughs> my buddy's gonna be so excited. I should have brought my own project here, <laughs> killing me. Ever since I built the CenterTech kit sold to me by 3D Chimera, I've been interested in that next industrial level for SLS printing. And I'm super excited to show you guys the S2, uh, which is the bigger brother to the kit and is also sold by 3D Chimera. Now this is Julian, and what you may not know is that he trained me to build this kit before I started putting it together. Uh, so he's incredibly knowledgeable and he's gonna explain the difference between the kit and the larger S2. Right, yeah, so fundamentally the difference between the Centratec kit and the Centratec S2 is primarily the build speed and the build volume. So you can see here, we have a display for the Centratec kit. Uh, it's 90 by 90 by 90 millimeters, but compared to the S2 in this cylindrical build volume, you can see you can pack many more parts uh, in the same time. So with this large build volume, obviously you can print you know, really tall parts, but is, is that necessarily the advantage of SLS printing in larger volumes? I wouldn't agree with that, no. I would say um, the real strength here would be to be printing a lot of small parts. Uh, so because it's a batch process, you get the efficiency of printing many small parts over one large part. With it being a purely thermal process, tall parts tend to warp and bend, uh, and it's a lot harder to maintain your tolerances if you're doing a large part. But if you're doing many small parts, those are very repeatable, and they can uh, each come out very nice. If you could elaborate on the batch process a little bit more, in my video, I think people could appreciate the fact that you could print you know, multiple parts almost simultaneously, but obviously with such a larger build volume, uh, it's, it's kind of a different scale. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, of course. So unlike FFF or SLA, where you're constrained to a 2D build platform, in SLS technology, you really have the freedom to orient your parts in 3D uh, in this entire build space. Uh, so because of that, you can have uh, the start of one part at the end of another part when um, they're layered up. So you can really stack and nest your parts very efficiently. Um, and because the laser will pass through the entire build platform, uh, you really are exposing the build platform all at once. So really, you're looking at a cross-section over your height, uh, which makes it a very efficient process for nesting and uh, getting a, a full batch made. So you got to tell me a little bit more about what's going on over here, because we've got one printer, but two individual 
parts. Of course, I'd love to. So this is the laser sintering station, or LSS. This is where the printing actually happens, but we'll visit that a little bit here later. This is the material handling station, or MHS. This is where all the powder recovery and part cleanup happens. Uh, it features a HEPA filter in the back to pull any powder out of the air. So you're telling me that all the powder stays put in that chamber because I got a lot of flack in my SLS uh, printer video because I was cleaning the parts outside of the kit and kind of making a mess. Yeah, as you can see, everything is contained in this little volume here. Uh, it keeps the powder contained and as you can see, we can operate in a office environment. So then how do we get the powder from the material handling unit to the actual print unit? Right, once the cart is full of powder, then it will travel to the uh, laser station for printing. But I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, why don't we fill up some powder and start a print? So the first step of printing on your S2 is to take your 3D file and plug it into the system. This contains all the information required for both the MHS and the LSS. So the first step here is we want to load powder. We're going to select our 3D file. And you can see it automatically determines what how much powder you need to fulfill this print height. So just asking if our cart is empty. Safety is very important when handling fine powder, so we want to make sure that we're wearing protective gloves and a dust mask. I'll grab my mask here. Now in this step, it's going to lower the two reservoirs to that height. So this is a little different than the Sintratec kit in that you have two reservoirs instead of one. Uh, that allows you to apply powder in both motions, both left and right. So the benefit of applying powder in both passes is that uh, you gain a little bit of print speed. Because the laser is so incredibly quick, the slowest action in printing is going to be applying powder. So if you can save a little bit of time there, you can reduce your print time fairly drastically. Your build volume here is going to be that cylinder in the center. And um, now we can start filling up powder. Here I'm just kind of settling in the powder. When you pour it in, uh, it's not as densely packed as it needs to be for printing. All right, now we got a nice fresh bed of powder. We're ready to start printing. So we get to move it now? Uh, of course. With that exact same print file, we can press print. So can we watch the print? Yeah, we can watch the print. Uh, I don't think anything exciting is going to happen right now because it's uh, in the heat up cycle. Uh, but on the screen, we do have a live feed of what the machine's doing here. Some other tabs we have are uh, to track temperature. You can see there's quite a few more heater zones than in the kit. That allows a lot better thermal equilibrium, which produces a lot more consistent results in your print. So go back here to the camera, and uh, we'll come visit this again when it starts entering. So we have the SLS printed parts. If you've seen my past video, you'll know that we basically just brush off that loose powder. But there's a weird cage around this, these parts. That's right, yeah. So we printed uh, all 50 of your parts here at one time, and uh, we modeled up this cage around it. The reason we do that is it helps to keep all the parts together. We don't have to go digging around in the powder cake for each one. We know they're all going to be stuck together there. It makes post-processing really easy for blasting 
just kind of blast in through the cage, get all the powder out. And then if we do any additional processes, like dyeing the parts, which we're gonna do right here, you can do it all at one time. So one single batch, and it's all together. So right off the printer, I think that these parts look spectacular, better than any other 3D printing technique. That's just my opinion. But you're telling me we can make them look even better? Absolutely, yeah. So you know, if you look at these parts here, this is maybe what you're used to, which is like brushing the parts. And then uh, here we have the ability uh, to do blasting, and that's where these parts are. So that gives them a nice textured finish. Uh, from there, we can put them in this dye tank, and it's going to dye them black. So uh, we're going to get a really nice deep black color in there for all the parts, and that's going to happen as a batch process. That's something that we do here for a lot of our parts. This is actually the 3D Chimera dyeing system, and this is our proprietary dye that works with it. What's in the dye? <laughs> that's magic. Okay. All right. <laughs> and then uh, the very last step, which I love to show you, is the polishing. So the parts that we have here are polished but not dyed. And there's a really important step there, because once you polish the part, you're basically closing up all the pores on the outside of the part. So um, if we want to dye them, we have to dye them first and then polish them. If you go the opposite way, the, the dye won't soak into the part. Interesting. Yeah, so it, it actually helps make it even more watertight once it's polished. Do I get to do the honors of dunking it in? Yeah, the tank is ready. All right, careful, it's hot in there, but you should be able to just drop the uh, parts right in the top. There you go. Flip it on its side there. We'll let the dye soak its way around. And that's it. You can close the top. How long do we have to wait for? So the system is going to flow water through at a fixed temperature for about 30 minutes. At that point, the dye will have soaked in and penetrated all the parts. We'll pop them out and let them dry. All right. Tell them when you're ready. I'm ready. All right. So now that these parts are dyed, all you got to do is cut the top off and we'll put it in the polisher. Moment of truth. Oh, that cuts super easy. So if you're a job shop taking on custom orders for SLS prints, you could sort all the your customers' parts into these containers, right? That's the idea. Yeah. If you're you're taking on uh, a batch print for a particular customer. Yeah, you could have multiple cages inside. This particular one was designed uh, for the entire build volume, but absolutely it could be done for smaller build volumes as well. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, so here we are, the Syntertech polisher. Uh, it's a really easy process. Pop the lid off, go ahead and drop your parts in and hit start. Just like that. So this process is now going to uh, take a few minutes here and it's going to start to polish the surface of the parts and give it that surface detail that we're looking for. As you can see here, we've got um, two different polishers. Um, we fed all the parts into the large polisher. We might have been a hair over, a little ambitious on, on fitting them all there one time. Um, probably would have been better to split between the two. So the small system really works well with the Sintratech kit. And the larger system works good for the S2. Okay, so the moment of truth is here. Is it better than the aluminum part? Well, I think we're going to have to see. So this is nylon, dyed black, and polished. Okay. All right, so here's a bearing. Uh, you know, we worked on those tolerances for press fit. So we can see if this bearing presses in. Perfect. All right, let's do it. like butter. There you go. It's perfect. Now I've got a little surprise for you here. In that batch of 50 we snuck in a couple special parts. So uh, we took these and we actually did a lattice structure on these and lightweighted them. So I'm not sure if you're, for your application this will be a benefit or not, but we thought why not? Let's try it out. So uh, these guys are two different lattices, talking about 25% lighter just by uh, playing with the model. So we'll see if you want to pop a bearing in there. It should work just the same. That geometry is exactly identical. That's crazy. I mean, these are already really small parts with huge slots in them. For it to be, you know, 25% lighter, 
That's pretty incredible. You can imagine, obviously, if this was a huge plate or some other kind of um, structural part that you know, those weight savings could really make a difference. Maybe it won't work, you know, then my mill can stay in business. Oh, it's even better than the last one. <laughs> there you go. This one's 25% lighter. I mean, look at these. Now, if we compare that to aluminum, that's going to be a massive savings in weight. Oh, yeah. And we haven't even talked about the fixturing, right? I mean, I got to go home. I still have to use the soft draws. I got to probe this thing into place. Uh, I got to switch to a, a cutter that can take out the pocket for the bearing, and then I got to chamfer that. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're not even done yet. These are done. So, I mean, really, just to summarize, we went from a, a part that we didn't know anything about to a 3D model that we knew a lot about um, to a functional design that meets our criteria to, to fit that nice um, eight millimeter bearing. Yeah. Yep, all in a day's work around here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, thank you so much. You bet, thank you. Yep. It was really fun working on this project with you. After a successful day at 3D Chimera, Andy and I spent the weekend in Miami exploring a vibrant community. The food was amazing, the artwork was even better, and the beaches were the cherry on top. Unfortunately, I'm now back in my artificially lit garage, but now we get to put these carbon fiber soft jaws to the test. Just need to switch out the stock jaws of my Kurt Weiss. I couldn't ask for a better fit between these soft jaws and the parts that we need to mill. With these jaws, I can cut two parts in one setup. I'm most excited about the fact that I will only need to probe once for all 50 parts. Julian set the spacing between the two copies to be 75 millimeters on center, and every time I switch out these two pieces for two new ones, they're going to be in the same location, uh, so no need to reprobe. The program is all set. Really simple, just an interpolated pocket with a chamfer. It's going to be an interference fit. Don't look, I'm going to have to hammer it in because I lent out my press. Quick test fit. Much tighter fit, less wobbling, and the lead screw can still turn. Nice. This is how it should have been designed from the beginning. Here is one of the SLS printed parts. Let's just see if it has a similar fit up, and yes, much less play in the lead screw, but it can still rotate. So it looks like both methods were a success. You know, it's really cool how added manufacturing is both kind of competing with, uh, but also complementing traditional subtractive uh, techniques. Were there easier ways to do all of this? For this part, yes, but this workflow clearly has the ability to tackle much more complicated geometries. Big thanks to 3D Chimera for going above and beyond with this project. Links are in the description below for their website and services. Seeing all of 3D Chimera's industrial printers has made me want to explore more advanced forms of added manufacturing on this channel. The problem is that these printers are too expensive and my garage is running out of space. So don't be surprised if you see another video of me on the road. One last thanks to Andy who recorded all of the audio and visuals for this video at 3D Chimera. If you love it, shoot her a thanks in the comments below. If you hate it, ah, don't know what I can tell you, I can't get rid of her now. And if you like my subtractive manufacturing shirt, check out the merch link below to support this channel. And with that, I'll catch you guys in the next one.